Good morning, everybody, and welcome to PSG of Mercer County. PSG of Mercer County is a group that is here for you, anybody that is in any career transition. And like we always do every Friday morning, I'm happy to say happy Aloha Friday. So we do celebrate, or at least I celebrate, Aloha Friday. It's casual Friday in Hawaii, and they do so by wearing Hawaiian shirts and Hawaiian wear. And I just thought that was really cool, so I like to do it too. So have a happy Aloha Friday. And in addition to being Aloha Friday, today is National Unicorn Day. Obviously a very important holiday. And the one reason why I thought to kind of talk about that is, you know, unicorns, well, of course they're mythical, but they kind of look like horses that really stand out because they're colorful and they've got a, the horn in the front. They don't look like regular horses. They could be a unicorn and a batch of horses and you'll always see the unicorn. And so in job search, we want to be the unicorn. We want to find a way to stand out from the others in the pack, from our competition. So I just thought it was kind of a nice analogy to be able to relate what we do with job search and being that unicorn, that one that stands out as being special. So hopefully you can uh, get a little bit of um, the unicorn rubbed off on you as you continue with your job search today and going forward. So do have a happy unicorn day. And uh, we do have a lot of resources here at PSG of Mercer County. We are here to help anybody that is in a career transition by providing uh, some level of resources that might be available, um, uh, information, uh, training programs, these sorts of things. We don't find people jobs, but our goal is to help you become more efficient and effective in your own job search. Now, among the things and tools that we have, we do have our LinkedIn group. Our LinkedIn group, it's not a hidden group, but it's a little bit private because what we do is when you find our group, it is called PSG of Mercer County. And so when you look for the group on LinkedIn and find it uh, just by typing in PSG of Mercer County, you will immediately be put in what's called pending status. You won't be instantly accepted into the group because what we do, we check about once or twice a week for anyone that has requested to join. And then we look at our attendance records, either from these meetings, and the GoToMeeting does record attendance for us, or our prior attendance, because we do wanna make sure that only people that have been to our meetings at least once are accepted into our group. Because that means that these are people that really understand and get job search and will be helpful in that way. We're just trying to keep people out that are list collectors and name collectors who are joining the group for their benefit only to get access to lots of people and names. Uh, we have over 1,600 members in our group right now. So they they're all went through job search or were a job seeker or visited our group. So it's a good chance if you reach out to anybody in our group and you can reach out to anybody in our group, even if they're not your first degree connection. But if you reach out, there's a good chance that they'll be sensitive to that and, and reply to you. And I can't guarantee it, but there's a very good chance because they're all job seekers. In addition, we do have our website, psgofmercercounty.org. So please feel free to check out our website if you have not done so in a while. We do have an event calendar. It's a tab right at the top. Our event calendar is populated with all of our upcoming programs. So we do keep our schedule, which includes the name of the presenter and the program topic they will present. And so that's populated now through the beginning of August right now, and then a couple of sporadic after that. So uh, we do have our event calendar fairly well populated. There's no obligation to be here every week and to join our group uh, and attend every week, but there may be uh, an opportunity that you don't wanna miss a certain presenter or a certain topic. So go look at our event calendar, see if there's a speaker or a topic of interest to you. And then you could just put that of course on your own event calendar and not miss that program of import for you. And so that's all that we have. So just as a reminder for our ground rules, uh, in just a moment, I will be introducing and turning over the presentation uh, uh, to Lynn. I'm so happy that she's here. I'll introduce her in a moment. If you have a question, you could just type the word question in chat and then we'll wait for a good break point and we will uh, recognize you and you can then unmute yourself and ask your question of Lynn. If you prefer not to actually speak uh, on the recording, because this is a recording. Uh, if you prefer, just type your question into the chat, but proceed it with the word question. There's so many introductions and, and other comments that are in the chat. I want to make sure that I see it 
And the easiest way for me to see it is I see the word question. And then after that, you can actually type in your question and I will just read it out loud and Lynn will then happily answer the question. Okay. And again, until, until we call on you, I just ask, please keep yourself on mute. So, but for right now, PSG of Mercer County is pleased to welcome and welcome back Lynn M. Williams. Lynn Williams is an ED candidate, is the executive director of the Great Careers Group in Bang, an all-volunteer 501c3 nonprofit organization that provides career education and networking for job seekers in career transition, including veterans, and employed and self-employed for career management. In addition, Lynn is also the owner of Around the Clock Executive Helper, a writer of resumes and LinkedIn profiles. Lynn presents unique research-based workshops on LinkedIn, resumes, the applicant tracking system, the art of networking in person and online, and other career-related social media and technology topics. She is currently working on writing her doctoral dissertation and is a contributing author to Find Your Fit, A Practical Guide to Landing the Job You Love, uh, along with the late Dick Bowles, who is the author of What Color of, Is Your Parachute? In addition, she writes a weekly career column in Vista.today, that's a website, Montco.today, Delco.today, and Buxco.today, and other publications with LinkedIn tips and more. You can connect with uh, Lynn on LinkedIn with a personalized message, and you can visit the Philadelphia Area Great Careers Group website and read their score success story. They were listed as number one in the Philadelphia Business Journal's Business Networking Associations in December 2020. The PSG of Mercer County is always pleased to welcome our own guardian angel, Lynn Williams. Thank you very much. All right, can you see the screen? Yes, we see your browser with the strategic research based. Okay, great. And you can hear me fine, right? I can All hear right. you fine. So, here we go. I did put in the chat a bunch of my links, including the link to the deck. Uh, aside from my presentation today, uh, there are some links in here leading to some articles and other things that you may want to take note of. So there's learning beyond this session. Now, this particular session is more of a big picture. It's, it's more of a how-to with strategies, tips and tricks, and things you may want to consider. I teach a three-hour workshop every month at the Chester County Library in Exton to the tune of nine hours of free LinkedIn training. And that is more in-depth, hands-on. So Saturday, April 17th from 10 a.m. to uh, 1 p.m., I will be teaching LinkedIn part two of three. In May, I will do three of three. And then in June, I'll be back in one of three. And you can take any of these out of order. Now, a little bit about LinkedIn. <clears throat> it now has over 740 million people worldwide after being launched in 2003. And every second, two people join LinkedIn. So today's learning objectives are where and how to incorporate keywords, including those from job descriptions, how to brand yourself, what's your secret sauce, and why you need to engage in thought leadership on LinkedIn. Now, there's no one right way to do LinkedIn, but I have a philosophy. So I am sharing my research and my philosophy, and you can consider integrating some of these tips and tricks also although other people have their own tips and tricks. And the bottom line is, is it working for you? Are you successful? Are you getting out of it what you are putting into it in the way of strategies to make your profile more optimized? Now, when I was in career transition for 11 and a half months in 2013, I recognized these things, these little plastic things, an awful lot. And I 
also did not have LinkedIn um, optimized. And I went seven and a half months sending resumes that were highly formatted through applicant tracking systems, uh, which probably only read my header. And I didn't have a, an interview for seven and a half months. So I realized I needed to change my strategy as a job seeker. So instead of looking for the full-time job, I decided to look for the part-time job. And I mentioned it at a meeting and I was hired the next day. And then I kept using it again and I got some more part-time jobs that actually wound up um, getting me more than 40 hours per week. And I had those until I actually got the full-time job offer, which is what I really wanted at the time because of the health insurance. And then I did that for almost four years. So in November of 2017, after giving three weeks notice, I decided that I was so passionate about the career industry that um, I had been working on since 2013, that I was gonna do a deep dive in it and here I am. Excuse me, So Lynn? you have to think, yes. So there's a question, you were mentioning number of users on LinkedIn. Do you know how many recruiters are on LinkedIn? That's from John. No, I, I don't. I, I have no idea, I've not done that research. I don't know if they have uh, you know, any stats on that either. But there's a couple links at the bottom of that page um, where there's statistics. And it, you know, you you know and I know you just go into Google and you can do a Boolean search um, with those types of terms uh, and, and see what you get. I, I don't know if you'll get anything. I don't know if they track that or not. I'm, I know they track their paid recruiters because that's a lot of their income but they may not uh, track their their recruiters that use the platform that are not using um, the, the official LinkedIn recruiter platform. Thank you. But no matter what it is that you do, <clears throat> you wanna begin with the end in mind. You know, you've heard of Stephen Covey. So what do you want that LinkedIn profile to do for you? If you think about it, Research says you got three seconds to impress somebody with your photo and your headline. And then if I were to tell you further, goldfish have an attention span of eight seconds and humans seven seconds. So if you have your headline and your photograph with three seconds, that leaves four seconds for people to look down to your about section to the beginning of that and are you enticing them to read that little bit at the beginning so that they click see more so that they can see a little bit more about you? So I am going to play this video. And if by chance the sound doesn't come through for some reason, it's only music. You know, just look at the visuals. Hopefully it will come through. Just $67. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay. So let me go on to is that the next slide. Hold on. Got to go back. There we go. All right. So an interesting article that I ran across in the Washington Post, and I'm going to read this one because I, I really like what this says. To cognitive neuroscientists, humans seem to be developing digital brains with new circuits for skimming through the torrent of information online. This alternative way of reading is competing with traditional deep reading circuitry developed over several millennia. So if we go back to thinking about the goldfish with eight second attention span and humans with a seven second attention span, you know, and people are skimming and scanning now, they're not reading all the way from left to right because we have so much data and so much content that we are faced with every single day. It's a lot different in a K-12 classroom in the language arts class where teachers are actually measuring the students' number of words per minute as well as their understanding. But as adults, what's happening is we're doing nonlinear reading. Our eyes are going all over the page. So if you don't have a way to stand out with your content, uh, it may be glossed over. When I go onto people's LinkedIn profiles and I see they've got paragraph upon paragraph upon paragraph, for the most part, my eyes glaze over and I do not read all that content. If it is not more bullet pointy and short and sweet, um, you know, I just keep moving on because I have so many other things to do and read and look and see. So there was a study done by the ladders and they took two resumes. The left resume is just a straight black and white resume. The right resume has some shaded lines or shaded bars. And you can see that the recruiter's eyes per the heat maps that were measured go two thirds of the way down on the plain black and white resume. And it goes from top to bottom on the resume that has the shaded bands. Therefore, I um, adopted this uh, shaded band resume as what I do. So if you think about how that relates to LinkedIn, um, LinkedIn has sections, they're definitive sections and it's standardized. It, it used to be on LinkedIn that you could move the sections around, but the recruiters complained about it because they were going to look for certain things on pro people's profiles and they wanted it standardized. <clears throat> well, when you pay six, seven, eight thousand dollars a year using the recruiting platform, that's a lot of LinkedIn's money. So they listened to the recruiters and they standardized it. Now, if you think about it, we're a visual society. In a PowerPoint, except for me, who's more instructional, <laughs> I am, uh, you're supposed to tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, or tell them, tell them what you're going to tell them, and tell them what you just told them. Well, in a, in a resume and in a LinkedIn profile, you can really only do those two first steps um, because they're more, you know, flat documents, so to speak. So therefore, the band, the shaded band, is you're going to tell them what you're going to tell them, and underneath you tell them. Tell them what you're going to tell them, and you're going to tell them. By having a little pop of color, according to psych colorpsychology.org, I use blue. And blue has more um, positive connotations than negative ones. So by having that section break, it kind of relates to LinkedIn, uh, but it also is visual for human beings. So here's what my resume looks like. I'm not looking for a job, so mine is presented a little bit uh, um, more different than, than it would normally be. But if you look at the top left, 
you can see that I'm using um, the keywords that I might potentially use in my headline in LinkedIn. I'm telling people what I wanna be when I grow up. Then I write a value proposition. It is written in first person implied I. And then I have core competencies. These are skills or uh, bullet points that are all in alphabetical order. To me, as a former uh, K-12 teacher, I have nine Pennsylvania Department of Education certifications, and I did used to teach math. So I look for a sense of logic. And to me, the alphabetical order is a sense of logic. So if people notice that you've got your list in alphabetical order, the hiring manager, is my gut feel, is gonna notice this and say, oh, he or she has uh, blah, 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 and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. Oh, and they also have this. So they're gonna hone in on the requirements for um, the job of the must haves of what you must have before they'll continue reading the rest of the resume. Now, in a resume, you really want to pack a punch with the top half of the first page. Why? Because research says you've got six to 15 seconds for those human eyes to, to gloss over the resume. And if you don't have that eye-catching information where they can see the must-haves for the job, you're not going to be in pile A you might wind up in pile B or C if they are manually sorting it. Now, I also put in career highlights. So these are buckets of where I'm combining my for-profit and non-profit experience all in one bucket. And I wanna highlight those skills um, that are in addition to um, my core competencies or keywords but I also want to try to put something quantifiable in there for me to stand out. So these, this is a typical section I would put in, you know, somebody else's um, profile if they were a, a client of mine. And how does this translate to LinkedIn? <clears throat> well, since I joined Clubhouse, I have tweaked my LinkedIn bio to be more bullet pointy um, than it was before. So I've got a couple of sentences and I've got white space in between. So it's not so dense in content. White space really is magic for me. And then I've taken capital letters and I've made my own section breaks, so to speak, in um, the about section. Now, and the right hand column is you know, continuing down on the about section, but you know, PowerPoint is landscape, not portrait. So I had to pack it all on uh, one slide in this way. <clears throat> and then the contact and connect section is all the way at the bottom of my LinkedIn profile. Now I make it easy for people to contact me and connect with me. Not a lot of people might know to go to the contact info section because they don't know LinkedIn well enough. <clears throat> so at the bottom of the about section, I put my contact information, my email, my phone number, uh, as well as um, book a call with me. Now, not everybody on LinkedIn knows that they may have some incorrect settings on their um, public profile. And if you are not a first level connection, you may not show your email and your phone number. So that's why it's always a good practice to put it down in the bottom of your about section so that people who are not first level connections to you can contact you. <clears throat> your LinkedIn profile photo is not your Facebook photo. You don't want to be <clears throat> looking like you're on the front of GQ magazine. You don't want a blurry picture <clears throat> that is off color, wearing a half black you know, or with half black because of what you're wearing. It's not a place for your family. It is not a place for you, you know, to, to, to wear your graduation garb 
um, that would be, you know, an, a, a two hour ceremony. And, you know, you could post that on Facebook, but that should not be a LinkedIn profile photo. And if you look at the bottom right, you know, and I know that's either at a party or a wedding and, and the people um, uh, to the left and right where the shoulders are cut off probably have that red cup in their hand. So that again is not a LinkedIn profile photo. It should be business-like. Now, whether you wear a suit and tie or whether you're more casual, or whether you have um, a background that has something in it or not, I mean, you have to really think about this. <clears throat> All these people have friendly, char charismatic uh, smiles, but the guy in the top left, he's leaning forward a little bit more, so it's maybe not quite as uh, formal, business-like. Um, top middle, that is obviously a teacher who is all about her K-12 classroom. <clears throat> top right, he's also a teacher, and he is, um, you know, not dressed in a suit and tie, but he has a plain background, and I think it stands out nicely. Now, the um, bottom left, you can see that she has a clear delineation between sky and grass. The bottom middle is my oldest daughter, and I told her I hate that picture, and she's got rid of it since then, but I didn't like it because it was bare um, uh, shoulders based upon her shirt, and she had her um, her lanyard around her when she did work in a school district. So I really think shoulders should be covered um, with, you know, something, short sleeve or long sleeve. And then the bottom right, another beautiful picture, but there's a lot of stuff in the background that makes it a little bit um, uh, busy for me. Now you can go on to photofeeler.com and you can do a quid pro quo thing. And I did it for about a half an hour and I got 28 votes as to what people think of me in the way of competency, likability, and whether I'm influential. But you have to give out your opinions to other people's photos when you look at them. Now, if you don't want to do the work and spend the time doing the quid pro quo, then you can always pay for this platform and then get people's feedback. Any questions that we have so far? There are none posted, but folks remember, you can just type the word question and we'll All get right. to your question right away, or you can actually type question with the question and we'll read it out. Great, thanks, Lynn. Yeah. I am not watching the um, chat, okay? So, you know, David, please pop in when there are questions. Thank you, I will. So, you wanna think about how can you build SEO into your LinkedIn profile? SEO meaning search engine optimization. How do you be on the first page of Google? Now, let's talk about your online photos. You want to have the same photo that you are using professionally on each of your platforms um, so that there's rec uh, recognizability. Um, and you want to rename your photos to help build SEO. So what does that mean? Well, if I was a job seeker as an executive assistant, uh, you can look in the bottom left-hand corner and you're gonna see some keywords and then you're gonna see my name and then some more keywords before the .jpg. So this is something called a meta tag. So instead of your photograph coming off your um, camera as dscn1839.jpg or .png, whatever it may be, you can now right click and rename that photo and you can do 256 characters before the .jpg. However, you want to make sure that you pack a punch with the first 60-ish characters because that's what Google indexes. Now, why do I say 60-ish? Well, each character for each letter of the alphabet has a different width. I is very skinny. 
L is very skinny for lowercase. N has one hump, M has two humps. That has to do with the pixels, the width of the letter. So I can't give you an exact 62, 64, 66, whatever. It has to do with the number of pixels of the words that you choose. Now, I have the utmost respect for Bryn Tillman. In fact, she's going to be coming up in a slide in a little bit. And she's not a competitor. She is a colleague, a LinkedIn colleague. And she and I did a brainstorming session one day, and we both um, talked about making meta tags. And then she said, you know, Lynn, I put the name at the tail end of those 60-ish characters rather than the beginning. And I'm like, and why do you do that? She says, because people are looking for the key words, but you want your name associated with those key words. And I'm like, oh, that's brilliant. I'm going to change my presentation. And after all these years, I'm now going to share the reversal of putting the name from the front into the name of the back end of those first 60-ish characters. So if you were to type that out and you were to do a word count, you know, you would see that the Williams you know, winds up being in the first 60-ish characters along with all those other keywords. Now, if you want to learn a little bit more about MetaTag and there's a how-to article, you'll go into the bottom part of this computer screen and there's a blue word called MetaTag. It is underlined and that is a hyperlink to a how-to article. Excuse me, Lynn? Yep. Yeah. So we have two questions. Okay. Is posting a black and white photo okay? My old firm used a black and white headshot, so I use the same one. You know, my daughter's current um, headshot on LinkedIn is black and white. I don't think it needs to be color or black and white. I think you choose what you want to choose. But the thing is, you want your photo. If you are not using your photo, if you're using some kind of logo or something, then um, you are violating LinkedIn's um, user agreement. You do want your photo, but black and white is fine. Okay, thank you. Another from James. For someone looking for a manager or director position, should the LinkedIn profile picture be in a suit and tie or is an open collar shirt and jacket fine? Hmm, so, um, I guess if you are looking more for a managerial and executive position, um, my gut feel would tend to be more the suit and tie. But if you're actually going to an interview, you actually need to make um, an inquiry as to what the best method is for that interview. For example, if you were to show up at an interview, even a virtual interview, at price uh, at PwC, then you would be overdressed because they are more casual in their culture and their environment. So the safest thing that you could do is when you get asked by HR um, to join in on an interview, um, make a statement and say, hey, I would typically come in a suit and tie, but I know we're working in a virtual world but I would like to respect the culture of your company. And I'm asking what would be the appropriate attire for me to come in in a virtual interview. It's always good to ask because you wanna make sure that you fit in you know, with, with the rest of the crew of who um, you are interviewing with. Um, but I would maybe tend to lean on the side of being more conservative and wear the suit and tie in the picture but that's up to you it's one of those 50 50 things and uh as marty latman says it depends right and uh we have now now they're flowing in lynn and okay i just picked this one up please remember uh, put the word question in front i want to make sure i see them but here's one does it matter if the photo has to be recent oh 
It should be recent. I'm totally guilty of this. Believe it or not, this photo is from 2014. And I have this coupon with this professional photographer. And I was kind of waiting till after I got my second vaccine before I go visit her um, to, to go for a photo session. Uh, but, you know, I obviously have changed a lot <laughs> in the past uh, seven years. So it should be a photo of what looks like you. Sure. Are you balding? Do you have gray hair? Yeah, but at least you be you. And people do worry about, you know, if they have that balding or that gray hair, you know, is there age discrimination that's going to go on? Yeah, it's very potential. It's possible. Uh, but the thing is, do you really want to work at a company um, who, when you show up, do you want to waste your time and their time? If you show up looking like you and they reject you because it's all, you know, 20 and 30 somethings or whatever, you know, that's probably not a good culture fit in, in the first place. So I would embrace your maturity and seasoned work experience and you are who you are. You can't change that. Okay. And here's another from Christina. When recruiters search for candidates, does the search engine only look in the about me section or also in the career experience section? Ah, uh, that's a very good question. My daughter is an IT recruiter. Well, she works for an IT recruiting firm. She was a recruiter. She's now an account manager um, and she supervises recruiters. She does have that LinkedIn recruiter platform. So I have seen the back end of what it looks like. Now, <clears throat> there are five areas that I typically put in keywords. <clears throat> and if you wanna write these down, number one is your headline. Number two is the about section. Number three is embellished job titles. Number four, skills and endorsements. And then number five is projects and publications if you do have them. So it's not just the title, but it's also in the description area. I try to cover all my bases um, with keywords. So uh, from what I hear, the, the headline um, from the algorithm has a pretty heavy weight in it, <clears throat> but so do the skills and endorsements section. And, you know, those other sections, I've heard different things from different people. Um, and because I don't work for LinkedIn, you know, and their algorithm is, you know, secret, um, <clears throat> we never know. So the best thing to do is to get all those keywords in those sections so that, you know, you cover all your bases. And I will be doing a live demo of some keyword strategies when we get to the end. Okay, thank you. And by the way, I did type into chat those five sections for anyone who couldn't write them down fast enough. It's in chat now. Also chat will be made available after the end of this program. And there's another question from Tetiana. I heard that on LinkedIn search, <clears throat> you can only see second and third connections. Then recruiters are asking to be connected. Do they see me? With 740 million people globally, you have your first level connections, second and third, and then there's everybody outside of that funnel that is not in your network. Now, as far as recruiters are concerned, I really don't know the answer to that question. Um, if they have the recruiting platform, if they can get to the people that are outside um, that funnel of first, second, or third degree? I really don't know the answer to that question. Okay, so good, let's move on. All right. So once you determine your keywords as a job seeker, you need to weave them in to your LinkedIn profile. You also need to weave them into your resume. So I believe in having a base resume, actually two of them. So one of them is the pretty resume for human consumption. 
And the other one is what I call a deconstructed resume for bot consumption. And then you have your LinkedIn profile. So as a job seeker, I believe that you can streamline your processes much more if you have matchy, matchy, matchy in your career documents, meaning your base pretty resume for humans, your deconstructed resume for bots, and your LinkedIn profile. That's, you know, easy when you got to weave a word into um, bullet point number two between word six and seven. You need to have your career documents fluid. And when you have a base resume and, and you try to um, analyze the keywords from the job description and weave those words into your resume to make it a custom resume, um, then you know, oh my goodness, I only have one LinkedIn profile. What do I do? Well, when we get to the live demo, I will uh, provide a, um, a little commentary about that and how you, you know, manipulate and manage uh, those keywords for your resume versus your LinkedIn profile. So stay tuned. If you are self-employed or maybe you're a job seeker who has a side gig or side hustle, you know, you still need to weave those keywords into your profile. So again, here are the target areas for the keywords. And David said he put that uh, in the chat. And there are a couple links to some articles where you could read some more. Now, a couple of um, keyword analyzers that I really like um, are JobScan and WordArt.com. <clears throat> JobScan is $49.95 a month or $89.95 for three months. It is an excellent platform, but it is not the be all end all um, <clears throat> for keywords, but it will help you along the way and you can get some freebies out of them, but you know, they are a for-profit business and their goal is to make money. So that's why there is a subscription fee. <clears throat> On the other hand, there is wordart.com. That is a free platform and I'm going to do a live demo on that also. <clears throat> so if you wanted to take um, a job like administrative assistant, you know, if you just put administrative assistant at the top of your LinkedIn profile, you know, that's a dime a dozen. That doesn't make you special or stand out in any way, shape or form. So you have to add other keywords uh, and titles around this so that you stand out in some way, shape, or form. Now, if you think about personal branding, you want to somehow be different. You want to distinguish yourself. So that's why, you know, I say make yourself stand out and add different keywords to that administrative assistant so that you are special. There's something you know unique about you that you can offer. Why? Because 93 to 94% of hiring managers do look at LinkedIn for potential candidates. And if you're not sharing your secret sauce, um, you know, you're you may be missing out on an opportunity uh, of what somebody is looking for. You've probably heard Jeff Bezos or Dory Clark, you know, say something about your personal brand. When you are not in the room and people know who you are and what you do, and they're talking about you, maybe you have a virtual sales force, um, that's when you know you've built your personal brand. <clears throat> so here I am um, doing a presentation from Pennsylvania. And this is probably, I don't know, what is it, about the dozenth time? David, I think that I've been here with you at the um, mm. Princeton Public Library, even virtually or in person. When and, you get to 18, we'll give you our Kai Award. Oh, great. Okay. And, and I'll have a special seat like Alex. Yeah. Yeah. Next, right next right. to him. Yeah. Oh, awesome. All right. So um, uh, you definitely, you know, people may be talking about you or share your name. And, and and say, oh, you, you need to know Lynn Williams or, 
you know, you need to join her group because you could you could learn more about career education topics and and, and networking and so forth. So that is somebody else that might be talking about me who um, the word gets passed on and that's my virtual sales force. So I, in essence, built my brand so that my name gets passed on. So thinking about your brand, what is your niche? You know, what's your sweet spot, your wheelhouse, your bailiwick? You know, when, when I shared this um, deck with my daughter, She's like, mom, what are these words? <laughs> so maybe they're not millennial terms, but um, you know, they all are synonyms. And then think about what your value proposition is. <clears throat> if you look at this image, this is done by Liz Ryan. She has built her brand by adding these um, cartoon type um, images to each of her articles. So when I see this type of an image, I don't even have to look at the author because I know I've seen um, all of her previous articles and, and this is how she has built her brand. Now, speaking of value proposition, so when you write your value proposition in first person implied I, you know, you're you're not using those um, first person pronouns, you know, like I. That is not something typically done in a resume. Um, it is more written in resume ease, so to speak, in the first person implied I. However, in LinkedIn, you do want to weave, you know, a little bit of I into your profile. Like, why do you get up in the morning? What sets your hair on fire? You know, what are you passionate about? You need to also share that on LinkedIn. Um, as a former uh, um, certified high school English teacher um, and someone writing a doctoral dissertation now, I, I really am a little bit hung up on starting a sentence with the word I. To me, it's a little bit more narcissistic so I, I would at least do currently comma I or make some kind of phrase comma and then use the word I. Why? Because when somebody comes to your profile, it really isn't about you. It's about them. What, are your, what do you offer in the way of pain points that you can take away, problems you can solve for that employer? What is it that you can do to help them? It's the what's in it for me. So I would definitely take away sentences starting with the word I. It's still okay to weave that in, but just do it in a slightly different way. So that value proposition at the top can also be turned into a value proposition letter. And a value proposition letter is about 100 to 150 words, and it's short and sweet. And it's not reacting to a job posting, but it's being proactive and sending it out to CEOs or hiring managers or HR directors um, for target companies of where you want to work. So you can learn more about that by clicking on the link. So I will do a word out demo, but I do want to tell you I use word out for a couple of reasons. It used to be called Taggle, and there was an old video that I recorded, and I one of these days I'm going to record a bunch of new videos. I'm going to get some captions underneath and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> but you can make a word cloud banner for your LinkedIn profile. You can make uh, word clouds for any articles that you may publish on LinkedIn also. So there's some step-by-step -step instructions in that hyperlink. Matchy, matchy. I love this uh, um, uh, image. You know, you do want to have that matchy, matchy as a job seeker between your career documents because it really does help streamline processes and it will save you time. But your LinkedIn profile is far above and beyond putting your resume in, but I think you should put your resume content into LinkedIn. 
but you want to use white space in between those bullet points to make it skimmable and scannable. Now, this is a very old um, uh, screenshot from jobscan.co. I don't have the current version because I'm not job seeking, <clears throat> but the same type of information will come out of it. You put your resume on one side, you put the job description on the other side, JobScan will um, review it and, and tell you what kind of skills are matched, what kind of skills are found, and what's missing. And those are the skills that you need to weave in to um, your customized um, resume for a particular job. Now, your about section is about 2,600 characters, and I believe you should be putting keywords into your about section. Now, I don't put keywords in from a Google Doc with bullet points. The bullet points are big honking bullet points when you go from a Google Doc into LinkedIn. I really like the more petite bullet points that come from Word. So if you are working on Google Doc with a resume, turn around and go file, download as Word, and then highlight the whole section of bullet points, turn them off, and then turn them on again so that they will be more petite and you can copy and paste those from a Word document. So uh, the keywords <clears throat> methods, you could read a couple of different articles that I've hyperlinked there. And again, I already mentioned, you wanna break your about section down into sections and make it short and sweet um, and, and skimmable and scannable. <clears throat> So here are a couple of ideas for your about section. Um, you potentially wanna make a call to read or call to action. Um, whatever you do, make it SOS, you know, short, organized, skimmable and scannable, otherwise known as short and sweet. Um, put your core competencies and skills in there, uh, any continuing education and training, personal traits. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be like a certain format, but just don't have four sentences and call it a day when you've got 2,600 characters. You really need to maximize and optimize that section so that people can learn more about you. And white space matters. If you look at the box on the left, there's a bullet point white space, bullet point white space. It is far more skimmable and scannable than putting all the bullet points smashed together. You know, that becomes more paragraphy and hard to read. Please note that you will not see a period after any of these bullet points. They're bullet points, they are not sentences, and therefore there is no period. And if you have a couple sentences in a bullet point, personally, I take those and I chop them down and I um, build them into two bullet points instead of one. <clears throat> Now here's uh, Bryn, and if you look at her headline, look at the um, um, uh, about section also, where it says learn top LinkedIn <clears throat> and social selling strategies. So what she is doing is she's making a call to read. She wants you to click on that see more because hopefully <clears throat> that opening entices you to want to learn more. Now, my daughter is connected with this gentleman as a first level connection, but I was a second level connection and I still am. So I get the gray coat hanger. So please know that people that can see your picture, there's far more times, I think it's like 14 or 21 more times or something like that, that, that people will want to connect with you if they see a photo versus not. So please check your public profile settings. And I think the statistics are that if somebody sends you an, an in-mail uh, message that it's 
like 36 times more likely that somebody will open that in mail um, for a picture that they see versus not. When you <clears throat> when you are reaching out to connect to people, make sure you personalize that connection request. You might see a follow button only. So look at their more or message or something like that, and you will see a little drop down menu. And people say, oh, well, I just click connect on my mobile phone. No, don't do that. Click on the more button and you will see that you can actually send a personal invitation from your phone. So it's always nice to personalize those invitations so you know where you first connected. Hey, Lynn, thanks for coming to PSG of Mercer County today. Um, I enjoyed your presentation. Let's connect. Okay, so that tells me that you first learned about me on this particular day when you are reaching out to send me a connection request. And that actually winds up in the thread between us. Now you can have 50 skills and endorsements, so have 50 skills and endorsements. So um, maybe I should take a pause here. Are there any questions so far, David? Nope, there are no questions at this moment. Okay. Thank you. All right, and also, you know, put out some publications and projects. Um, you know, I, I wrote an article uh, yesterday about autism and neurodiversity um, and, you know, hiring on LinkedIn. Um, I married a man with autism. I have a daughter who is very high functioning with autism. And I'm still learning. Um, so I published that article this morning on my LinkedIn profile. So I learned something um, very interesting that I had never learned about before. And I learned that there's a gentleman by the name of Hans Asperger, who was a pediatrician, and he was collaborating with the Nazis during World War II. And based upon his findings as to where these children were on the spectrum, it meant life or death for them. So I will never use the term Asperger's syndrome again. I will only call it autism spectrum disorder. So if you'd like to learn more about that, please feel free to read the article. And I'd love comments on that too. So here's my oldest daughter. And she now has a black and white photo. But when she was going through St. Joe's University, um, she got a master's in instructional technology. And her professor asked her to make an online portfolio. And she asked if she could do that on LinkedIn. So she added video, she added Google Docs, et cetera. So you can also embellish your LinkedIn profile by you know, including other media. Now, not all media is allowed, uh, but you know, some is, and you can you can uh, go into LinkedIn help to find out what is allowed and what is not. Excuse me, Lynn. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so we do have a couple of questions. Robert's asking. I think the featured section is relatively new on LinkedIn. Can you comment on how or if this is important and how to best leverage? Using it. I will do that. How about if I um, uh, get through this and okay. then I'll actually go on my profile and point a couple things out when sounds I go good. live doing the demos. Okay. Yep, sounds Anything good. Else? And then, yep, Christina has a question. What if the publication was done while working at a previous employer? Is it okay to have that on the profile? Well, that all depends. Um, if it is confidential information, proprietary information, um, and if you wrote it yourself, <clears throat> um, and if you need permission, I guess, from the employer or not, um, you know, it's one of those all depends things again. Um, so you have to use your best judgment. But sure. if it's, you know, patented or confidential or you have a NDA or something like that, then then no, use your best judgment. Just just say no. Write a new article based upon your expertise, you know, on the, on the same topic 
and and uh, you know just make sure that you rewrite it in a in a different way. Okay, and here's the twenty nine ninety nine question: Is paying for a premium membership worthwhile? Oh, that's a really good question. So. <clears throat> If you are a job seeker, you can pay $29.95 a month for the LinkedIn Job Seeker Edition. I believe that it does put you higher on the stack um, on, on recruiters' radars than not. Um, I pay $59.95 a month plus tax for my business premium account. Do I need to do that? No, I could probably get by with a free account. But Having the premium account allows me to see the last 90 days of people who have viewed my profile. I'm honestly not sure if you can see 90 days with the 2995 version or not. LinkedIn's changed things and I'm not a job seeker, so I, I don't have that version right now. But um, you know and I know, hopefully you've heard this like 100 million times, you need to network your way to your next job. Do not rely on just applying on LinkedIn jobs. Do not rely on job boards. Do not rely on staying on your computer all day, applying, 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 applying. No, you have to get out and network, meet people and talk to people. And that's how, you know, 80% of the jobs are found. Um, it's via, you know, employee referrals and whatnot. Reach out to people and have informational interviews. Let me just tell you about a story of someone in my organization who just landed. So for many months, she was talking about her target company. And then she didn't see any jobs that were you know, there, but she really wanted to work for this target company. And <clears throat> then she saw a job and she went ahead and she applied for it. She got crickets, nothing. And she says, hey, Lynn, you know some people at this company. Could you make an introduction? I saw this job and I really am excited about it. So sure enough, I make an introduction to one person that I knew at the company. And I said, this person is interested in learning a little bit more about your culture. Would you be open and interested in having an informational interview with her? And sure enough, she had the informational interview and at the end of the informational interview, she did say, uh, I wanted to have this informational interview because I saw this job. This is my dream company that I wanna work for. Is there anything that you can share with me that would be helpful for me to get to this position? Well, her name was passed on and sure enough, she had interview one, interview two, interview three, and she starts April 19th, just like that. She got ignored and crickets when she tried to apply a lot, um, on her own, but networking her way into the job because she was working her network and LinkedIn and connections, asking for introductions. You know, I've heard that story so many times. Does that help? Apparently so. And someone did respond that the job seeker version does show the last 90 days. Okay, of, great. Of people of you, so they're still doing that. All right, let's move yeah. along. All right, so it depends if you have the money in your budget, I guess, but you still need to network your way. All right. You could have up to 100 groups. I have 100 groups. You wanna be in your um, uh, college, you know, undergraduate, graduate um, uh, groups, uh, alumni groups, as well as your industry groups. You definitely want to engage in thought leadership. You know, if you go into Google or LinkedIn and, well, Google and say, when's the best time for me to post on LinkedIn? They will typically tell you like Tuesday at this hour, Wednesday at this hour, Thursday at this hour, et cetera. You know, I put my article out today um, just because I just wanted to do that. Um, but I did do it in the morning. So apparently a lot of people are, are, uh, leaning more towards morning postings than, um, you know, afternoon or weekend postings. But you do want to blog in some way, shape, or form. If you don't have a website, consider LinkedIn your website and, and write articles. Share your expertise. Get it out there. 
and make sure you throw in some hashtags. You also want to volunteer. So PSG of Mercer County is a 501c3 nonprofit, right, David? No, we are not a oh, not for profit. No, uh -huh. we are a completely different designation. We are not for income. <clears throat> okay, so there's a couple <laughs> other PSGs that are, you know. PSG of Central New Jersey is a 501c3, yeah. Okay, so the Philadelphia Area Great Careers Group, which is the official legal name of my nonprofit, um, but we go by Great Careers Group and Bang because we serve people outside of the greater Phil Philadelphia area now. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, and there is somebody on this call who is a volunteer for us and creates all the bit.ly links that we have that go into our Salesforce. So as people work on their Salesforce certifications, <clears throat> it's an opportunity to volunteer and give back in the pay it forward community who, um, where, where you can actually say that you work as a quote unquote employee for the company, but we're really not an employee, but it fills the gap because you want to have a two present job on your LinkedIn profile. You need a job to get a job, according to the articles that I have come across. Um, so it's better to fill that gap, you know, find something that you're passionate about, you know, vets and pets and kids, or, you know, if you can't find anything there, I'm always taking on volunteers. I have database work that can be done remotely. But if you volunteer, you can fill that hole and fill that gap on your LinkedIn profile. But you can also say that you're a volunteer. <clears throat> now, in 2016, um, there were 16 career coaches from around the country that contributed chapters to this book. And Dick Bowles, the author of What Colors Your Parachute, wrote the foreword. I am chapter eight on applying for jobs. My main focus of the chapter started to be about the applicant tracking system and keywords, but it expanded into a variety of other things. How do you deal with salary for online um, applications? What's the hidden job market? How do I tap into it? Uh, Lynn, could you submit a, a example resume, a cover letter with paragraphs, a cover letter that's T-style and a value proposition letter? So all those, these other little extraneous things got published in this book, but this is, you know, the definition about that value proposition letter. And it really is appropriate for people to be proactive, um, seeking um, jobs at their target companies and writing to the CEOs or hiring managers or the HR department. Like, why not? What do you got to lose? <clears throat> so your homework you know, dive into all these different sections on LinkedIn. Here's a profile checklist. And you can go on your social selling index to see how you're doing. Now, I used to be at 83, top 1%, top 1%. If I'm to click on this, I now tanked down to 79 and 1% and 2%. <clears throat> Why? Because the algorithms changed back in October, 2020. And this purple line has to do with LinkedIn um, Sales Navigator. I do not have Sales Navigator, so I will always be shy on that purple line. All right, you need to have 500 connections on LinkedIn. Just Google that. Why do I need to have 500 connections on LinkedIn. There are thousands of articles. So, you know, just know that because the algorithm, it will treat you much nicer if you have those 500 connections. So if you're just starting out on LinkedIn, you're nobody until you reach out and make at least 30 connections. So from 30, your next goal is 500. Um, so get out there and connect, connect, connect with other people in this group that you're networking with so that you know you you reach that threshold excuse me lynn here is yep <clears throat> a question from peter what do you think about finding a company's talent acquisition team members and reaching out directly to them via email or even on linkedin absolutely be proactive <clears throat>
nothing gets sold sitting in an office. That's something my dad used to tell me because I used to be the Western Regional Sales Manager. I had 14 states. I had to be out there. I had to leave my office. Yes, I had, <clears throat> I had, you know, administrative stuff to do, but I had to be out pounding the streets. I had to be calling on architects, builders, developers, and contractors, and telling them about my ceramic tile product, educating them um, so that, I don't know if you ever heard of Rincon Plaza in San Francisco, but I sold, you know, the ceramic tile, the two foot by two foot tile from Buchdahl, which is a German tile manufacturer, which clad the outside of the building. So there's a lot of technical stuff that um, um, had to go on with regards to, you know, the, the cladding of these great big, huge pieces of tile because they didn't want it falling on people's, you know, heads and uh, uh, causing any lawsuits down the road. You know, the San Jose shopping mall, 7,000 square feet of ceramic tile, you know, so I had to be out there talking to those people and the architects that specified. So by you going out and, and you know, reaching out to hiring managers, um, HR departments, you know, yes, good, be proactive. You got to sell yourself. <clears throat> Excuse me. Nobody is going to, um, you know, do that for you. You got to toot your own horn. Other questions? One more from Kevin. What is the link to the LinkedIn index number? Oh, the social sales link. So um, if you popped in late, you're going to get a, um, a a link to the deck. And I'll put that on, you know, again, um, at the end, unless you want to grab that link from my WAD. It's the last link, David. And, and pop that in to the chat again. And you could just click on that. Or you could just go into Google LinkedIn Social Selling Index or LinkedIn SSI. And it'll probably pop up for you but you have to have your LinkedIn profile open at the time that you click on that. Okay, and we are also publishing your slides as well, which has the active links. So that's okay. on our meeting presentation documents. Good, let's move along. All right, so here is my upcoming speaking schedule. Um, every third, thir Saturday of the month, meaning like April 17th is a week from Saturday, I will be teaching a three hour LinkedIn workshop I think I mentioned that early on. Uh, tomorrow, I'm being interviewed um, live on a YouTube, Facebook, believe it or not, from Philadelphia to Nigeria. <laughs> and uh, so um, it's not a presentation, but it's a discussion. And she is going to uh, dive in and have me answer questions um, and, and things I normally don't talk about about myself. I, I, uh, I might reveal some dirty laundry, you never know. Anyway. Um, April 14th, uh, doing what's your shtick, personal branding online and off, and that includes a LinkedIn SWOT analysis. Uh, join me at the um, uh, New York Public Library for beating the applicant tracking system. That is on Google Meet. It is not a Zoom. So you must log on with Chrome to be able to get to the Google Meet. So don't wait till the last minute to do that, but it's open to everyone. Uh, I'm also doing it again for um, uh, Bergen uh, County Fang for Marty Latman the next day if you are a member of Fang. And um, I'm doing this particular presentation again for PMI Delaware County and, you know, the how to develop successful job search strategies. So here are my contact um, information bits. And if you are on Clubhouse, please feel free to follow me. Uh, I don't have a lot of time that I can spend on Clubhouse. Uh, it is a, a, a wee bit of a time suck for me. <laughs> I've got lots of other things going on, but I do enjoy learning and connecting with people on Clubhouse. And if you don't know what Clubhouse is, it's like the biggest social media disruptor um, as of recent. Um, and it, it came out of the, the pandemic. It's, you know, like a talk show that's um, it, interactive podcast. And if you're invited up on the stage, then you can speak and ask questions. If not, you're in the audience listening. So if anybody, you know, wants to be on Clubhouse and needs an invitation, please let me know because I do have a few invitations. 
And here's a little bit about the Philadelphia Area Great Careers Group. We have four divisions right now. Uh, Great Careers Groups is um, DEI, um, uh, open to absolutely everyone. Uh, business Executives Networking Group is our mid to senior level, C-suite business owners. Nonprofit Career Network, we have a meeting every third Thursday of the month from nine to 11, so next Thursday. Um, and we have a speaker and it's all people that are interested in networking regarding nonprofit careers. And then we have the Creatives Learning and Networking Group. So that is for um, entrepreneurs or people that are thinking about side gigs and businesses. And our speaker this month is about SMM, social media marketing. She's just terrific. So again, here's the link in the middle to the um, deck and it is case sensitive. And then, you know, our upcoming events meet up and our membership is uh, below. Now we run about 600 events a year, potentially up to 50 a month. We will be slowing down a little bit for the summer because we know, you know, the numbers dwindle during the summer. Um, but I know there might be some career coaches on this call right now, and I am looking for a replacement for our Tuesday, April 20th, 9 to 11 a.m. Um, speaker who um, is not able to join us anymore. So I know David has spoken for us a bajillion times and Alex has. I would love to offer somebody new, you know, to uh, a career coach if you happen to be um, on this call and you haven't spoken for us before, I'd like to open the floor. Uh, a little bit about um, Philadelphia Area Great Careers Group. We did win a small business award winner um, for Chester and Delaware County score. We're one of six winners for 2020 and we're honored by that. And on Christmas day, 2020, we made number one listing on the Philadelphia Business Journal Business Association networking groups which is pretty super cool um and then you know there's a couple other awards there on the left so um just a little bit about the group i know you come here and david is so incredibly generous paying for all the technology and and whatnot um to run this terrific group of psg of mercer county um we can't do the same we have people that put their time and talent in, but we do um, have a, a membership fee. So just to give you a little perspective, we have people that come and pay $5 per uh, uh, as a non-member for a speaker event. But if you were to go to, um, you know, that, that um, uh, Starbucks and get a grande frappuccino, you might be paying like $5.30 or something like that, and you're gonna enjoy it for 15 minutes. The other option is to pay less than that per month for um, up to 100 hours worth of programming. So that comes out to like, I don't know, what, 10 cents or something like that, four cents uh, per, per event, something, you know, I haven't done the math there obviously, but it's really very small for what we offer. And we are a nonprofit um, and, in order to survive and sustain, we do have to charge a membership fee because, you know, people are always inquiring about that. But we are a 501c3 nonprofit. We are volunteer run and we want to keep paying it forward. But we're, you know, a big group with a lot of offerings and it's networking at every single meeting. So that's why we do what we do. All right. I'm going to now do some live demos. Uh, well, I'm going to pop up a couple things. So this social selling index, somebody asked about it. So it's linkedin.com slash sales slash SSI. Since I have that up, um, here's our meetup group. The meetup group is free to join and it does blast daily. We are a very robust group, but you will find, you know, we do advertise um, affiliate events on here. And today this is an affiliate event. So 10 people from my group, you know, said that they were going to come. So hopefully they, they registered on that. Um, I have a Google Doc and, you know, that has links um, to our events on there. And then here's our same thing, 
Uh, I change from the calendar to just the listing. And then if you go to the contact us, you will see there's all our links for our social media and newsletter and all that good stuff. So let me go to LinkedIn. Now, somebody had asked about the featured section. So the featured section is um, a place where you can put um, things that you want to stay up longer than having it shorter and just, you know, poof in and out. So um, this particular um, video is about six minutes long, and this highlights all of the events for the month of April. And we make these videos um, and, and I publish them, you know, for each month. And we have, you know, potentially up to 50 speakers or so, or 30 some of speakers. And so I wanna highlight all our speakers and that stays, you know, for the month of April. It'll be a new set of speakers for May. I also put a document up here. So if you want to see a visual um, of, of what is coming up, I copy and paste things from our events page in here. But you can also have articles. So here's an article that has gotten um, a lot of traction from when I wrote it for Vista.today. Um, <clears throat> there's somebody who actually um, came to our uh, job search um, accelerator and he was black and he did not want to put his picture on LinkedIn because he didn't want to be discriminated against when he was applying for a job. And I think that's just horrific. Like nobody should feel that they cannot be themselves on LinkedIn. Be proud of who you are, no matter, you know, um, what, what you color you are, or what you represent or your beliefs. So um, just as a side, I am actually um, uh, a descendant of John, Adams' wife, the second president of the United States, and John Quincy Adams. And those were the only two presidents out of the first 12 who did not have slaves. So that little tidbit is, is in this particular article. But that article is very important to me because, you know, I believe in DEI and I think, you know, everybody should put their picture, no matter who they are, on LinkedIn. So I told you that I wrote an article today. So here's more the want to learn more about autism. And then here's, you know, me promoting that I will be here at the virtual Princeton library. Um, but this featured section, you can, you know, you can see all of what is in the featured section and uh, you can see what I've, I've put in and I can take them away and, you know, tuck them away. But if you go to somebody's, um, activity section, you can also see whether they have posted uh, a document. So there's my last document, April 2021 education. You can see my posts. All right, so there's the post for this morning and for the article. You can see the articles. And I don't write a lot of articles on LinkedIn because I write them on the blog um, for the website, as well as for those four magazines. And then you can see all activity, which means the likes and comments um, uh, of, you know, other people's posts. <clears throat> so if, um, let me go back to here, I mentioned Boolean search and while well, I still have this on my mind. So if you were to type in Boolean and you wanted to find out, oh, what was that she said about Boolean search? How do I search people on LinkedIn? Do I have a slow website? Okay, here we go. So here are a couple articles that you might want to um, take note of. And one is how do I do a Boolean search on LinkedIn? And then when I came to PSG uh, to hear Ed Hahn one day, he reminded me like, oh my gosh, yes, you know, you can do a Boolean search um, for LinkedIn on Google. So I've done some step-by-step step -step, uh, instructions on that. So those are really good articles to take a look at. All right, now 
I also put my articles, and I'm a little bit behind on posting a couple of them, <clears throat> but I do post them in my publication section on LinkedIn, which is right here. Whoops, I lost it. Okay, so right here. So publications, there's lots of things to read here. And again, I'm behind, but these are all linked to the publications that I wrote for Vista and whatnot. So I'm gonna do these two live demos and then I'll take some other questions. I don't wanna take questions during the demos, um, but I'll just go back because just so long we as we get this stuff in. So I do this particular um, example all the time. So if I wanted to say project manager, and I'm gonna tab over and I'm gonna make it Greater Philadelphia. So this keyword or key title, project manager has 3,618 hits. If I were to change this to project management and search again, then it has 11,189. So you have to look up all your key titles and keywords. You know, marketing director, director of marketing, VP marketing, EVP marketing, SVP marketing, like they all have different hits. So you want to try to have um, a, a generic term so you can get found, but you also want your niche terms so that you also get found based upon your very little sliver of, of you know, expertise. Now, if I were to go to Google Trends, which is trends.google.com, then I can also see that Google Trends mirrors LinkedIn. So I'm gonna put in project manager, and we're gonna search that term. And then I wanna compare it to project management. And you're gonna see that the red line is above the blue line. So project management is a term that is searched more than project manager. Now, here we are, this is United States. So I want to now type in Philadelphia. And it has, well, are we talking Philadelphia, Philadelphia and PA, or Philadelphia, the New Jersey side, or Philadelphia, the PA side? I'll do Philadelphia, the New Jersey side. All right, so you can still see over the past 12 months, project management is still searched more than project manager, but it's been kind of a weird year. So let's just look at the past 90 days. Still, project management is a good term. So you really have to do your research. Like I can't write a resume for anyone until the client's done about an hour and a half worth of research on keywords. So we have a good solid foundation for the base resume. So now let's look at a couple other examples. Let's say in the job description, it used the word budgeting. Okay, and I'm gonna do Greater Philadelphia. So that has 3,932, but is that the best word on LinkedIn for the skills and endorsements section? You know, what is the quantity of the jobs in my particular area where I'm looking? Well, let's look at budgets. So we go from 39.32 to 51.08. Mm, better word. What about budget? Synonym. That goes to 64.23. So in my skills and endorsement section, I want to have budget, but in my um, alphabetical list of core competencies at the top of the uh, resume, I'm gonna add ING so that it matches the job description. So you have to be able to be flexible and understand how you can look up keywords on LinkedIn to use the best version of the keyword versus use um, uh, the words that are in the job description. So here we are, Academic Program Specialist 2 for the PMI. When I go here, I have a premium account and I can see that on my LinkedIn profile, I have public speaking, teaching, research, and higher education. But I am missing these other six 
um, keywords. So by having a premium account, and I don't know if Job Seeker sees this or not, this tells me the words that I have to weave in to my resume and my LinkedIn profile. So if I've got dead wood on some skills and endorsements that are not doing me any good, then I would want to make sure that I put these in so I have that exact matchy matchy. So let's just take this job description and we're gonna copy and paste it into WordArt. So WordArt is free. And once you've established an account, you just go in and click the red create button. And then you're gonna click on import over at the top left here. And then I'm gonna right click and paste. Now, what I wanna do is keep remove common words. I don't need the A, the an, and the the. I do wanna remove numbers that has no meaning to me, but I wanna uncheck stemming. So when I uncheck stemming, if I were to say strategic is a root word of strategically, I want exact matchy matchy. I don't want to have uh, the root word. So now I click on import words in a nanosecond for free. I just got um, a, a read here. PMI is used four times, academic four times, role four times, accreditation four times. The bad thing about word art, but you can't fault it because it is free, it will not put two words together. So for example, higher education, those are two words that go together. Project management or project manager are two words that go together. It's not gonna do that for you. But if you roll down this little bar, okay, um, you have got you know, some um, other options. I only pay attention really to the first page. You know, you, you can only get so anal when you're trying to do the match between um, your custom resume, but at least take the time and note that you've got to weave these, these keywords in. Now, if you click the visual button, if you are a visual person, it'll show you visually, you know, what the keywords are. And, and when I um, uh, guide job seekers, you should always take an electronic copy of your job that you are applying to. And I'm a Google girl, so I put everything in a Google Doc, and then I'll take a screenshot of this um, uh, Word thing here. I'll take a screenshot of this visual image, and then um, I've got that. So if, just think about in March 2020, you know, what do we have? We wound up having like 40 million people unemployed. People were caught with their pants down. They were not ready because they were not doing career management. So what happened is that people applied for jobs and then companies were doing the cricket thing because nobody knew what the heck was going on. Well, what if you had applied for a job and then three or four months later they called you because they say, okay, well, this stuff's not going away right now, but we still need to hire. We need somebody for this role. Well, if you didn't keep a copy of that job and they took it offline, then you're in a pickle trying to prepare for an interview. So I believe you should keep everything in um, you know, electronic form. I recommend Google Docs, but some people do it the old fashioned way. They want you know, stagnant documents like a Word doc. Granted, you have to have that for a resume, but I don't think that's the best way of being fluid and taking notes and, and, and whatnot. Uh, you, know, you, you, don't have, you have to save it again as a new version. So I like Google Docs. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Happy to take on questions. Thank you, Lynn. And I did also post, in addition to Word Art, other programs as well. One is called Tag Crowd. Another is Word Clouds. Um, there was another one I used to use. They're apparently no longer active, so I won't mention their name. And then, you know, there's another uh, keyword analyzer. And actually, I should introduce you to this gentleman. The company is called Glass Squid. And uh, oh. what it does, it's it's not quite like a job scan. It's kind of like job scan on steroids in front of the yellow sun and getting all this power uh, because it will actively compare content 
to your uh, LinkedIn profile, to um, the job board postings. Uh, so hmm. um, I, introduce... I haven't heard that one. Thanks, David. Yep, I made a connection. You know, we have our networks. <clears throat> so it's called glassquid.io. Uh, they use an AI. Right now, it's only for IT jobs where they look at like the job boards. Um, so I'll mm -hmm. introduce you to Suresh and hopefully that'll be okay. Great. I'd love to have him as a speaker if he speaks. So um, here are the, the couple um, uh, companies that David mentioned. They're also here. So there's there's a variety of more word cloud generators. And then um, there's a great article on informational interviews, online learning. You know, there's, you know, 80, 90 some odd links for that. So just put keywords in the search bar in our website and you'll come up with stuff. Okay, so no questions have come up. So I think we will simply say, Lynn, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. You are our guardian angel uh, by uh, being a part of our group. I don't know how many times. If you say it's a dozen, I think that's very believable. You're always here to help and support us. And not only giving us wonderful presentations based on topic, but the research that Lynn does into these programs and the, the applicant tracking system, LinkedIn and others, just make it that much value, more valuable because we become empowered on how to use those uh, tools more effectively by the work that she has done. So thank you so much. Yeah, and by the way, um, I am working on my doctoral dissertation right now. So I will be reaching out to David at some point in time and hopefully in 2021, if all goes well. Um, I am writing my dissertation about LinkedIn, about job seekers who are Gen X and boomers. And um, uh, what other? Oh, uh, yeah. Digital immigrants, meaning Gen X and boomers. So at some point in time, I will need 10 people that that are in New Jersey, Delaware and Pennsylvania <laughs> That I will need to interview, um, and it will, you know, your your identity is not revealed any, by any means. But um, I will be asking David to to pop that out. Yep, I'd be happy to. Interviews are fine. Just don't insert any like probes into my brain or anything. Then uh, you know that's I'm not interested in. Yeah. Uh, I think Alex had a question. Yeah, Lynn, I want to make a comment. Uh, you talked a little earlier about metadata behind pictures. And you know, I dealt with this several years ago, and actually many of my pictures have a ton of metadata behind it. Uh, however, uh, I don't know if you are aware or I don't know if I'm right, but I read somewhere that all the major uh, sites such as LinkedIn, they strip it. So I- It could you be. I don't while work for LinkedIn, talking, so I don't no, know, you know. You see, while you were talking, I went into Google image and Bing image, and I just put in my name. And I appear there a million times in presentations and so forth. Why? Because I have a lot of metadata behind my slides and behind my pictures, but regretfully, it doesn't work on LinkedIn. Yeah, we may not have control over it. So, you know, for me, maybe it doesn't work on LinkedIn, but if you had that that meta tag on your picture and you put it on Twitter, you put it on Facebook, you put it in a link in an article, you know, it, it still may have some validity to that. Like Moz.com is, you know, a, 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 has got great articles on, you know, that metadata but I don't work for LinkedIn. So I'd rather do it, you know, and, and kind of cross my fingers, toes and legs, um, uh, hoping for that. But it, you're right, it may not go through because LinkedIn may, may strip it before it goes out to Google. We don't know how it works. The other thing you have to be careful with the meta tags, they're called alt tags in the website world on the images. And for those of you not technical, you may remember you have a photo album, not a digital album, but you took real photographs. And on the back of the photograph, you might have written something, uh, you know, 1980 vacation at the lake, something to remind you. Well, and then you would go back and look at your photo album. There's the digital equivalent of putting that type of data on any photograph. And that's what Lynn and Alex are talking about. 
not Here's exactly david yeah i know i know no that's yeah, okay um, this is the this is the non-tech analogy all right so, but here's what I want you to be concerned about. There are a lot of places where you can download free photos and use them on your website, your LinkedIn, whatever you're gonna use. A lot of them come with their own metadata already packed on. So you're gonna to wanna to strip off their metadata and put your own. For instance, if your website, if you have a website or other social media is about you as a project manager and you download a picture of three people working in an office and it's an office situation and there are three people of three different races, you don't know what the metadata is. It may say diversity photo. And that's the name of the photo. And that's what gets, and then that's fine that you like the image, but those tags that are attached to the photo may not be relevant to the story you're trying to tell on your social media. So do, do be careful of how you use them as well. Yeah, so make sure you look up what an alt tag is versus a meta tag. They yep. are two totally different things. So the alt tag really does help people with assistive technologies um, uh, hear or learn about um, what that picture is about um versus the meta tag has word dash word dash word dash um before the dot jpeg and 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 or png and and that puts the the keywords in you know for yeah. for Boop. the photo because i yeah. i build seo into yep. our website as of fall last year yeah there's a lot of seo a lot of SEO tips, you could name the file that way. And technically, Lynn, that is not a meta tag, but that is a, the URL of the uh, file name of the image. Oh, yeah, like slug. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But anyway, um, I want to just quickly move on because uh, it is time for us to wrap up. And uh, so, Lynn, thank you once again. Very well-informed presentation, as always. Um, not only do we expect nothing else, but you've really set the bar. Uh, so thank you. Um, so much want to let you know other programs that are coming up in the next couple of weeks uh, just in case you um, are missing me and are not getting enough of me i'm doing a presentation next week right here april 16th called interview preparation and tips so we're going to talk about some tips and best practices for both in-person interviews and um, virtual or online interviews. So uh, the market is opening up. I'm hopeful that you are beginning to get interviews and you do have to prepare accordingly. So that's next week, PSG of Mercer County, next Friday at 10 o'clock. April 23rd, Bill Pagula will be here talking about developing your marketing plan, which really talks about your strategy in job search. So I'm so glad Bill will be back talking about developing your market plan. So that's what we have right here for the next two weeks. Um, also, tomorrow morning, the Breakfast Club of New Jersey will be meeting virtually. Uh, so they meet at 8 o'clock in the morning, thebreakfastclubnj.com thebreakfastclubnj.com. It is a virtual presentation. Andy O'Hearn will be presenting with Dogged Resolve, how best to communicate and connect in post-COVID, in, in the post-COVID employment world. So uh, you may want to go put that on your event calendar and join the group tomorrow morning. Just go to their website and you'll get the connection information, no other need to sign up. Uh, New Jersey Job Seekers does meet every Tuesday at 7.30 in the evening. I did put their link in our LinkedIn group, same link that they use every week. And what's nice is the topics you discuss or whatever you want to talk about. They don't typically have a presenter. It's just an open discussion of, of the individuals who join. PSG of Central New Jersey is psgcnj.biz. They meet Mondays at 10.30 in the morning, psgcnj.biz one of our cousin organizations, and another cousin organization, PSG of Morris County, psgmc.org, psgmc.org, will meet Wednesday morning at 9.30. So that is our program. In just a couple of minutes, we'll end the presentation. I will leave the program open for open discussion and our after party, And uh, but just until then, I simply want to thank Lynn again, and for all of you who've participated with your questions, thank you for participating. Uh, her program slides are on our website now on the PSG of Mercer County website. We will post the video of this program, uh, uh, if not by this evening, by tomorrow. So that'll be available on our YouTube channel. So until we get to see you again next week or somewhere else virtually, I'll simply say,
Bye, everybody.